الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وأرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه وجعلنا من الذين يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنا Brothers and sisters, it is again a great opportunity to see all of you here today, alhamdulillah to talk to one of the noble causes and this noble cause is talking about the virtues of Ahli Bayti Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the family and uh, his family has a high maqam, high place in the teachings of Islam there are so many statements out there um, a lot of these statements are sahih are uh, authentic statements from the Prophet Alayhi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and many of these statements are Hassan Hadith uh, hadiths that are at least good and uh, there is a lot of them too that are weak very weak in narration uh, like many other topics in Islam you got hadiths that are weak hadiths that are uh, Hassan and hadiths that are Sahih but what's important is uh, to be recognized that there are too many Sahih hadiths as well too many sound hadiths regarding the virtues and the need of the believers, of the followers of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to follow the example of Ahli Bayt Radiallahu Anhum Jami'an. So first, before I start my speech, I would like to mention to you the main two sources that I have relied upon in order to deliver the speech today. One of them is the endless nobility of Ahli Bayt. This is a book that you find this in England, unfortunately not here in America. Um, as a matter of fact, I did not have the English copy. This is the first time that I'm seeing the English copy. Dr. Mirza brought it here today. I was relying only in the Arabic version. Um, so I have it, it's on PDF online. I downloaded that and uh, I just relied on that. But for those who have this book, it is, it is one of the greatest books that are written on Ahli Bayt, on the virtues of Ahli Bayt, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. From Sheikh Yusuf al-Nabhani. Yusuf al-Nabhani, it's a very famous um, Syrian scholar who, uh, was not, who did not pass away too long ago. He lived in the last century and was also at the same time uh, a Sufi and also a Qadi. So he had the, he was master in both. This book is a very good book because it not only gives you the narrations of Prophet ﷺ regarding the virtues of Ahli Bayt, but also it goes into details and it, and it explains uh, these traits. Why is it important? Why, should, why we should pay uh, attention to this one? It also goes into details explaining the verses that are related to Ahli Bayt Rasulullah ﷺ. So it's a great book. I was told also that uh, Yusuf Samarai, another scholar uh, from, uh, from Baghdad, uh, wrote another great book about the virtues of uh, Ahli Bayt. I mean, there are hundreds of books being written, but uh, in a scholarly, I'm talking about with references and in scholarly basis, you know, there will be more rarely books to find. And uh, evaluating the hadith as well. So this is among one of those books. Um, so Imam Suyuti, after mentioning this book, I'm also mentioning Imam Suyuti. Imam Suyuti, many of you have heard about him. He is uh, one of the top scholars of Islam, 
was excellent not, not only in tasawwuf but also in fiqh, in hadith, and in many other religious sciences. Uh, Imam uh, Suyuti wrote a book, uh, a compilation of 60 hadiths. Is this the one? Yeah. So this is over there at the table. There are many copies? Or? Yeah, there are many copies for those who would like to. This is beautiful. May Allah bless you, Dr. Mirza. Uh, that you have a copy right here. Uh, the dead become alive by the grace of the Holy... Uh, of the. I would not put of the Holy Five because it says Ahlul Bayt. Uh, so the dead become alive by the grace of Ahlul Bayt, of the family of the Prophet Wasallam. So this is uh, available over there. This is one of other sources that I have relied upon. However, this one is mainly narrations. It does not have uh, too much explanations about the hadith, but it has mainly uh, the introduction, you know, the, in the introduction you can see some explanations there, but overall the hadiths, they do not have that uh, interpretation. Uh, the reason why I said, you know, why I would not put the Holy Five, not that I'm against, not that I don't believe that the Five are the family members of the Prophet ﷺ, I strongly believe in that, but since there are many other statements of other, including the Sahabis, you know, they do not include only five, but they include others. And there are other narrations of Prophet Sallallahu who is from Ahli Bayt as well. So, I would not just restrain that or limit that only to five. Out of the diversity that exists out there. I would just put it, you know, the dead become alive by the grace, by the grace of Ahli Bayt. The family of the Prophet. And I would leave it right there. Because saying the Holy Five, then you are already limiting that. Even though those five are the family of the Prophet ﷺ, but since there is a lot of diversity there, uh, I don't see it fair just to uh, divide it like that. Today, inshallah, we're going to talk about the merits or the virtues of Ahl Bayt. Um, and also we're going to talk about uh, who is Ahl Bayt. And at the end, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, one of the controversial points nowadays in the Islamic world regarding Ahli Bayt. And I'm not, this lecture is not meant to be in, in details. As I said, there are hundreds and hundreds of hadiths regarding Imam Hussein, Imam Hassan, Imam Ali, Fatima to Zahra, and so many uh, other from the family of the Prophet Imam Jafar and this and that. So I don't intend to mention all the hadiths like I said. So I don't want some of you to be like, Oh Imam, why didn't why you didn't mention this hadith? Why didn't you mention that hadith? That is important too. I tried my best to get these hadiths that I consider them to be important in order to, uh, to uh, go into details about the topic that I have prepared here today. So first of all, I need to mention at the beginning one very famous hadith that this is not the first time that I'm mentioning this but I mentioned before as well and this hadith it is narrated from Zayd ibn Al-Qam who, who says that the Prophet والسلام, said I am leaving with you something that if you would attach to it you wouldn't go astray after me لن تضل من بعدي أبدا. One of them is greater than the other. The book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a rope stretching from the heaven to earth. And my progeny, my family, my ahli bayt, they wouldn't separate until they would reach the pool, hawt. In the hereafter, we believe that when we are resurrected, the people are going to, uh, the believers, the followers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will be gathered uh, around the Hawd Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this kind of a pool or this kind of a lake and they would drink from it Amina uh, so my Ahli Bayt they wouldn't separate until they would reach the pool and look as you would replace me in regard of them this is a Sahih Hadith and it is also found in Jamia of Imam Tirmidhi. Imam Tirmidhi is very famous collector of hadith. So we got this Sahih, this sound hadith that talks about following 
the greatest source, which is the Quran, of of uh, the word of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and then Itrati, Prophet Ali Sallallahu Itrati Ahli Bayti, he says, my family, and they do not separate from each other. The teachings of Ahli Bayt, they do not separate from the teachings of the Quran. Or the teachings of Ahli Bayt with one another, they do not they do not have much separation in between. They don't have divisions in between. They have one. They they, they have mainly speak in one word. They're not divided. So follow the Quran and also follow the teachings of Ahli Bayt Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Imam Hakim also narrated in his Mustadrak, very famous book, <coughs> from Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the best from you is the best in his attitude towards my family after me. The best one of you is the one who has the best attitude, the best approach towards my family members after me, after I pass away. So this hadith is sahih hadith, sound hadith, on the terms of Muslim. So according to this, we are required to have the best approach, the best attitude towards the family members of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Now, I also want to mention to you where Imam, uh, where Shaykh Yusuf al Nabahani says in his book, وَذَكَرَ الطَّبَرِي بِسَنَدِهِ إِلَى سَعِيدٍ بِنْ قَتَادَةٍ أَنَّهُ قَالَ قَوْلُهُ إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرَّجْسَ الرِّجْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَهِّرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا فَهُمْ أَهْلُ بَيْتِ طَهَّرَهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنَ السُّوءِ وَخَصَّصَهُمْ بِرَحْمَةٍ مِنْهُ he mentions the verse number 33 from Surah Al-Ahzab. This verse says that God wants to remove the sins or the shortcomings away from you, all the family of the Prophet, and also cleanse you with a good purification or purify you with a, uh, with a good purification or purify you in a good way. Let's put it that way too. This is the verse. So two things here in this verse. God wants the Ahli Bayt to, to remove the sins, the shortcomings away from them, and also to purify them in the best possible purification. For whom Ahli Bayt? And it is mentioned that this, according to Qatada, and uh, Tabari and many other scholars, they are the Ahli Bayt Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through this verse is showing His Rahmah, His mercy. Man hum Ahli Bayt? Who are the Ahli Bayt? Wa akhtalaf al-mufassirun fi Ahli Baytihi fi Ahli Bayt Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi hadhi al-ayah. So there are different versions of the scholars when it comes to who is the Ahli Bayt that is mentioned in this particular verse. Not all of them agree that they are the same. Now, to cut it short, some of the scholars, and for people, again, if they are interested to know more details, the names and more reference and references and all of that, I do have them available, inshallah, later on after the, uh, after the speech. Some of them they say that Ahli Bayti Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are Imam Ali, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, Fatima al-Zahra, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself. So these are the five. And this idea is agreed by many, 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 many scholars, including the Sahabas, including Tabi'een, including Mufassirs as well of this verse, the commentators of this verse of the Quran. And that's why, as I said at the beginning, this translation here is made as uh, the dead become alive by the grace of the Holy Five. So they are relating to that, which is a major, major belief. However, there are other scholars as well, 
And I would say probably most of the scholars believe that this verse, and this includes Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu and Ikrimah, uh, which is Ibn Abbas from the family of the Prophet they say that the Ahlul Bayt in this verse refers in particular to the wives of the Prophet. Others they say, and like I said, the second opinion, it is the majority of the scholars. The majority of Mufassirin and all that. And actually I can remember very well the exact the name of one of the Mufassirs. Uh, or maybe one of the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but very important name. He says that those who do not think that this verse refers to the wives of the Prophet, they, they are making a big mistake. So this is out there as well. But again, as I said, I'm not saying only this, but I'm giving to you what do the scholars say in regards to uh, com uh, com commentary of this verse. And also some others, they say that it does not include only the, uh, only the, uh, the family, but also the wives. They're all together actually. The five and the wives. They are referred to Ahli Bayt Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And also there is another opinion that says not only them, but also the, not only the five, but also the family of Ja'far, Ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And also Aqil. And uh, also Ali, the family of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Also the family of Abbas, ibn Abbas and the others from his family. So it includes them as well. What we're trying to highlight here that the verse, whether it is the five, whether it is the, the wives as well, or the family of uh, his uncles and his cousins, this shows that the family of the Prophet ﷺ, has a great, great importance in Islam, in the teachings of Islam, and also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through this verse, it tells us that He is purifying them. He is purifying them, meaning that He is removing their sins away from them. So this is a very important point that needs to be highlighted. Why? Well, because when we approach the teachings of Islam, we need to consider the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. And also, you know, the first idea is supported by this, that uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam جاء ومعه علي وفاطمة وحسن وحسين قد أخذ كل واحد منهما بيد حتى دخل So the Prophet alayhi wa sallatu salam uh, grabbed all of these five. Uh, Ali, Hassan, Hussein, Fatima, all of these four, he grabbed them until he entered there. And he also, there's a narration that says that he, he mentioned, Allahumma ha'ulai ahlu bayti fa'adhib anhum ridsa wa tahirhum tadhira. He's making this dua for them. Oh God, these are my ahli bayt. In regards to these four. These are, he says, my ahli bayt. فَأَذْهَبْ عَنْهُمْ الرِّسَّةِ Cleanse them وَطَهِرْهُمْ تَطْهِيرًا And purify them in the best uh, manner of purification. And also it is mentioned that uh, Umm Salama came to Prophet ﷺ and she said, Oh Rasulullah, am I not from your family? فَقَالَ إِنَّكِ مِنْ أَزْوَاجِ النَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ عَلَىٰ خَيْرٍ you are from the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. You are in good stand, probably. This would be the best expression. وَرَوَى أَحْمَدُ وَالطَّبَرَانِي عَنْ أَبِي سَعِيدِ الْخُدْرِي رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى عَنْهُ قَالَ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ أُنْزِلَتْ هَذِهِ الْآيَةِ فِي خَمْسَةِ فِي وَفَى عَلِي وَحَسَنْ وَحُسَيْنْ وَفَاطِمَةِ and also, of course, Ahmed uh, wa Tabarani, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal and Tabarani as well uh, uh, narrate this from Sa'id uh, al Khudri, al Khudri radiallahu uh, ta'ala anhu, the companion of the Prophet, that the Prophet والسلام, said that this verse was revealed in particularly about the five. And he mentions among these are the Hassan, Hussein, Imam Ali, and Fatima. As I said, this is one opinion of the scholars. 
Now, let's get back to talk a little bit more about the virtues of Ahlul Bayt. Man kuntu mawla, aliyul mawla. Very controversial hadith. Let's see what we have here. Faqih bin Qatani, he says this narration was transmitted by a group of companions. Now we have mutawatir, something that is classified as mutawatir. By a group of companions, not like ahad, hadith ahad. Which means that it's narrated only by one companion. So, it is narrated by uh, many companions. And when Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu asked in Kufa, who heard it from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this hadith, there were 12 men who replied that they heard this. As it was reported from Imam Ahmed, this narration was transmitted from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by 30 companions. We have 30 companions who are narrating this hadith. So they say that silsila of this hadith is sahih, but the sanad, uh, the, the silsila is sahih, but the body of this hadith, it is hasan, at least. So then, you know, the, the chain of the companions to tabi'een and until it reaches us, or the books of, uh, of the imma, it is a sound chain. But the body itself of the hadith, it is Hassan. And the other thing about this hadith, that during the caliphate of Ali, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, people joined him due to this narration. You know, those who supported him, they supported him because they were motivated by this narration, by this hadith. Uh, now, what does it mean, the hadith? I think I, 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 I mistranslated this hadith, I just mentioned it in Arabic. <laughs> uh, to whom... To, to whosoever I am his master, then Ali is his master as well. So if I'm your master, master not your God or not somebody that we worship, we don't have those uh, uh, problems in, in uh, explaining this hadith, uh, but again, to the one who I'm his master, then Ali must be his master too. And this hadith does not mean, by the way, that Imam Ali radiallahu anhu wa karramallahu wa jahu is a prophet. And some people, they declared his prophecy. And we are strongly in disagreement with them. And we believe that whoever believes that Imam Ali is a prophet, after Prophet Muhammad alayhi wa he is a kafir. He's not a believer. Because it is mentioned in Surah Al-Ahzab, and in, many, uh, and in uh, many other narrations, it clearly states that the Prophet ﷺ is the Khatim al Anbiya'i wal Mursaleen. He is the seal of the Prophethood. So there's no need that the Qadianis and other groups in India and around the world, they would believe that there is uh, uh, other people after the Prophet to become Prophets and things like that. So all of these are false beliefs and we do not agree and we consider anybody who claims that thing to be a non-believer. Because this is an established fact. But this again states the virtue of Imam Ali. It states the virtue of Imam Ali that we have to consider him as our master, as our uh, personality who we look upon in order to establish our uh, true faith in our lives. So we take from him. You know, he's our kind of celebrity, let's put it that way. So we learn from him. This is a very, very important hadith. As I said, a lot of controversial stuff out there. Imam Ahmed narrated in his Musnad and Fadail al-Sahaba from Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu ta'ala anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Al-Hasan and al Hussein are masters of youth in paradise. And Fatima is chief of women in paradise except Maryam bint Imran. So now it's not only about Imam Ali, but now he's talking about the, we're talking about the virtues of Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein, who are the masters of youth in paradise. Sayyidah Shabab al-Jannah. And also Fatima, his daughter, 
to be the chief of women in paradise except Maryam bintu al Imran. This hadith is authentic due to other supportive roots and this chain is weak due to weakness of Yazid bin Abu Ziyad according to Shu'aib al arnauti Ibn Majah also narrated from Abu Hurairah who the Prophet وسلم, said who would love Hassan and Hussein he loves me who loves Hassan and Hussein he loves me and whoever would hate them hates me it is considered to be at least Hassan hadith good hadith Imam Tirmidhi narrated in his Sunan from Amir ibn Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas that when this verse was revealed فَمَنْ حَاجَّكَ فِيهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَكَ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ فَقُلْ تَعَالُوا نَدْعُوا أَبْنَاءَنَا وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ وَنِسَاءَنَا وَنِسَاءَكُمْ وَأَنفُسَنَا وَأَنفُسَكُمْ ثُمَّ نَبْتَهِلْ فَنَجْعَلْ لَعْنَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْكَاذِبِينَ when this verse came down, which means, Come, let us call our sons and your sons, and our women and your women, and our near people. This is highlighted right here in this verse, the near people. Near people and your near people, then let us be earnest in prayer. Let us be sincere in our prayer, and pray that the curse of God be upon the liars. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa called for Ali, Fatima, Hassan, Hussein, and said, O oh Allah, these are my family. And our near relatives, so that near relatives, he was referring to, the Quran refers to the family of Prophet alayhi wa sallam, made of the five, including the Prophet alayhi wa sallam himself. And this is a sahih hadith as well. This is a authentic hadith. Imam Tirmidhi narrated from Al-Barra bin Azib radiallahu ta'ala anhu the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Imam Ali you are from me and I am from you. This is also sahih hadith, sound hadith, authentic. It was narrated by Ibn Majah from Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said Hassan and, and Hussein are masses of youth in heaven and their father is better than them. So again this is a similar narration as the first one as the other one that I just mentioned before but also it includes the virtue of Imam Ali together with Imam Hassan and Hussein and this is also a Sahih Hadith. So as you see, I'm mentioning to you the Sahih Hadith mainly that are considered by majority of these scholars who are scholars of Hadith. And according to this, we can see how virtuous the family of the Prophet ﷺ is and how important it is for their teachings to be followed by every Muslim. When it comes to Say, uh, Sayyidatuna Fatima, radiallahu ta'ala anha bintu nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam she has great virtues as well and i think uh, there is uh, there is also a print out over there or no from uh sheikh tahir al-qadri you have only one verses of sayyida fatima it's about 105 pages and he also has a collection of hadith i don't think he goes into details he has only like narrations, but also talking about, with all references, by the way, uh, talking about her virtues. So it's, it would be considered, you know, a good size book, 105 pages, talking only about her virtues. And he's a great scholar, mashallah. Tahirul Qadri. And also the Arba'in, uh, there are also 40 hadiths from, uh, from Al Qattani. Imam Qatani who talked about the family members of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Dr. Mirza here has another copy of this. I don't know if there are. Otherwise it would be full of copies there at the table. But 
Uh, if you need to make copies, he will give you the link at least for sure. All right, so we, we talked about Fatima, Bintu Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Just remember this. Just remember this. When Prophet would go to any expedition outside the city, the first place he would stop at would be the place of Fatima. That would be the first place that he would stop. He would not go to anybody else except her house. He loved her a lot. And there are so many hadiths regarding to this. He loved, he had special love for his daughter. Special love for his daughter. And she, uh, she is the one before he passed away. Remember, he shared something very personal with her. He whispered in her ear and he said something. And then people, they were so worried later on. They wanted to know what was this whispering. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha goes to uh, her, to Fatima, and she says, what did he whisper in your ear? And as many of you know, that he whispered in her ear one thing, that he was going to pass away very soon. And she started crying because of that. And then he, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, said to her that she was going to be the first one to meet him in paradise. What does this tell? To be the first one to meet him in paradise. Um, the love that existed between both of them. So, when we talk about this connection, it's not only a simple father to daughter connection. We love our daughters, right? I mean, we love our children fine. We have that love that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has implanted in our hearts. It was more than just a simple love between the father and the daughter. It was a spiritual love that existed between them. It was a spiritual connection that existed there. That's why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is connecting. He's talking about your, you'll be the first one to meet me in paradise. And she started smiling right after that. Who would smile after crying like that? If, just pay attention to this, you, you, you would say to your daughter, you know, she's crying and all of a sudden you're saying, hey, but I love you. Okay, you know, you, it would touch her heart and all that, but she's still crying. She cannot just change like that. But he told her that you will be the first one to be with me in paradise, which totally transformed her inner world. It shook her inner world at that moment. Because he's not talking about like a normal love. He's talking about a spiritual connection now. That you will be with me in paradise. She believed in eternity in paradise. She believed in that eternal love in paradise. And therefore she became happy. Therefore she smiled. And therefore her world totally transformed. From all of a sudden crying that she's losing her father to knowing, realization that she's going to be with him in paradise. And she's going to be the first one to meet him in paradise. Look at this. This is now the true connection of Ahli Bayt with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa This is what Tasawwuf also emphasizes on that spiritual connection. Not only in a uh, human relation to relation type of connection. But it is a relation higher than that, more significant than that, a spiritual, con uh, spiritual connection which really considers to be the greatest and the strongest uh, connection. That's why we value them and their connection with Rasulullah for that fact that they had that strong bond. And we're not saying that the others they did not have. We're not saying that the others did not have but this, the connection between the Ahli Bayt and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is there by itself. It's kind of special. It's very special. Now, I need to stop and say a couple words now at the end, inshallah, of this, uh, of this speech. In regards to the, the, the points that are very controversial nowadays between so-called the Sunnis and Shias. Even though, personally, I don't like to say Sunnis and Shias and to defer them, you know, because all of those who are Ahli 
Ahl al-Iman, all of those who are Ahl al-Qibla, people of the Qibla, all of those who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in His Messenger, uh, they believe in the pillars of Iman, they believe and they fulfill uh, the pillars of Islam as well. Right? The, the, the five pillars of Islam, they don't reject them. They're all, they're all Muslims. However, nowadays in, in these new terms, we, we, we consider you know, to be the Shia split with the Sunni split. And by the way, majority of the scholars, uh, they consider uh, the Shias, not all of them, but uh, majority of them to be um, in accordance with the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam by saying that they are not they are not non-believers, and there is a small uh, there is a, there is a group of Sunnis who consider them to be non-believers, and the facts that they give are facts that in many cases they do not exist nowadays as much as they would think exist. Like for example, believing that uh, uh, Ali is another messenger uh, beside Prophet Muhammad. I think this this was probably apart from the Islamic history back in the days, but I don't think that it exists as much as some people make it uh, look like. Or people saying that uh, Jibreel gave the wrong message to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He was supposed to give it to Imam Ali, and this is totally, you know, like has nothing to do with Islam. The person who believes that is out of Islam. But again, do. Are there many people claiming this claim nowadays? I don't think so. There might be some, but we don't see it. We, we hear it even from Shias who say that this claim does not even exist in our communities anymore, but it used to be back in the days. Allah Ta'ala Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala knows the reality, whatever the reality is. Uh, we have to be very sensitive and we have to be informed before we make judgment, we, before we issue judgment towards the other people. However, from the Shias, uh, from uh, from the Shia community as well, you have a lot of them who curse the Sahabis, and we know that this is a reality. Um, a lot of them who curse the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who are also ummahatul mu'minin. They are the mothers of the believers, and this is not my statement, and this is not the statement of even the Prophet sallam, but this is the statement of the Quran. So, by cursing the Ummahat al-Mu'mineen, the mothers of the believers, then you are automatically going against the teachings of the Qur'an. So, what I'm trying to say is that there is a lot of hate in between, there is a lot of tension in between. And most of the time, the ignorant people from each side, they would go into extremes and causing life lost. They would, you know, they would kill, they would allow the killing, they would do a lot of stuff in order to uh, spread that hate and this comes from people who are ignorant from each side definitely people who are ignorant we should strive to I mean if just think about this brothers and sisters if we are spreading or extending our hands to the Christians and to the Jews and if the Quran is, command, is commanding us to do that by saying Qul ta'alaw all people of the book say, all people of the book, come to common terms, to a common word between us and you. So we don't worship anybody except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we do not take each other as deities beside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's come to common terms. Let's talk together. Let's try to worship one God. Let's be together in this. So Quran encourages us to do this with Ahl Kitab. What about people who share the same faith as we do? Shouldn't we extend our hand and say, you know, let's leave aside uh, the hate, let's leave aside the uh, things that separate us. If we have the common things, if we, have, if we share the common things together, then, then let's work on those things and see where we can meet with each other. You know, this is what Muslims should do nowadays. We have so much hatred out there. We have so much separation out there. We don't need any more separation. We don't need any more hatred. We need to talk to one another. We need to sit in a brotherly manner, in a human manner, as Islam taught us to sit. And not to accuse each other, not to blame each other, not to... Even if we believe that they are wrong. Even if we believe that they might have a wrong... Uh, a, a, a lot of... Uh, wrong teachings in their books. Let's come to common terms. Let's let's sit and talk. Let's discuss. 
If the humans, if the people, listen to this, if the people see the scholars sitting down and trying to come to common terms, you know, people as well, those who did not have an opportunity to study the details of Islam, you know, they will change their opinion as well. They will change their opinion even if they don't agree with all the teachings of the other side, at least they will respect each other. They will consider them Muslims. They will sit at the table and eat together. You know, they will, they will fight for the common cause, for the common right. They will have the same enemies and not become the enemy of one another. But treat the enemies the same. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this happening. Now, another point that I need to also mention here is that the love of, of Ahli Bayt is one of those points that should bring the Sunnis and Shias closer together. However, the claim also of the Shias who say that the Sunnis, they do not consider, they do not have consideration for Ahli Bayt Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I would say that that is not true. And we need to be aware of this. And I'm not saying all the Shias would say this, but I'm saying there would be some of them who would mention these words. A claim like that, it is untrue and unfair. Why it is unfair? You know, I personally heard this, and I'm telling you what I heard. Uh, who would say that, uh, look, you guys claim to have so many Sahih Hadiths in your books. But how come that we are the ones taking the teachings of the Prophet straight from his early bait. From Imam Hassan Hussein, Imam Ali, from the 12 uh, Imams and this and that. And you guys don't, you just relate on Abu Huraira, on Sayyid al-Khudri, on this and that. And they are not, you know, early bait. And you're claiming that you have the strongest hadith which says, you know, I would not say the strongest, but a strong hadith that says that uh, I'm leaving behind you two things. And what were those two things? The book of God and Ahli Bayt, the family of the Prophet. You have that right there. You believe that to be the correct hadith, the sound hadith. Then you're not doing that. Is it true that we're not doing that? That is not true at all. That claim though, it starts messing up with people's minds. Even Muslims who are Sunnis they would start down and go, oh yeah, they're right. We're not taken from any mate. Now, the answer is this. Uh, in the Hadith books, there are over 5,500 Hadiths, over 5,500 Hadiths that are narrated from Ahli Bayti Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Over 5,500, that's a big number. That can compile books with volumes. Number one. Number two, how can you claim that when you know and we know that Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, he learned, he was a student of Jafar Sadiq who is considered to be from Ahli Bayt. We, we are the followers of Imam Abu Hanifa, who is the follower of Ahli Bayt Rasul. So where does our fiqh comes from? Where does the aqidah teaching comes from? If it's not from Ahli Bayt. If you have over 5,500 hadiths, then what are we talking about then? Can we claim that we're not learning from Ahli Bayt? We are, we do have them. And that is a big part of our teachings of Islam, of the teachings of these scholars. Imam Malik, rahimahullah, he lived in Medina, he lived among Ahli Bayt. He learned from Ahli Bayt Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he's followed by so many, uh, by millions of people. Then if it is not from Ahli Bayt, then where it is from? So this statement, as I said, this statement there are some people, and again, I emphasize, not all the Shias are doing this, but some of them, 
who do this in purpose, you know, to belittle the teachings of, of Ali Sunnah wal Jama'ah, or to even cause doubts in the minds of many who follow the Ahli Sunnah wal Jama'ah. It is intentionally done, and it brings nothing else but hate and separation between the communities. We need to be aware of this. As I said, we need to strive for a common cause. We need to consider each other. If we have one Qibla, if we believe in the six pillars of Iman, five pillars of Islam, we worship none but Allah, we consider Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to be the messenger of God, his last messenger and his servant, then we are Muslims. Then we are Muslims. We can have our differences in, uh, in, uh, in fiqh and in other issues, that is fine. But what brings us together, it is that we have the same faith. This is how we need to treat each other, inshallah. And if we have this mentality, I think this would give a, a big strength to the Muslim world nowadays that is in so much in need of that. So if we start from faith right here, the other things too, they can be settled in between them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those who follow the strict teachings of his Prophet, his Ahli Bayt, and his companions, including the Al Khulafa al Rashidun. Abu Bakr, wa Umar, wa Uthman, wa Ali, wa Ashab al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa akhir da'wana, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa sallillahu ala rasulina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Thank you very much, mashallah. Very comprehensive, uh, scholarly uh, talk. And